This is a follow-up to my prior two talks on myocardial infarction organized in board style questions. All questions and explanations are obtained from the second edition of my book, Practical Cardiovascular Medicine. Question, a 62-year-old man presents with progressive dyspnea and chest tightness for the last week. Exam and X-ray are diagnostic of pulmonary edema and severe heart failure. Blood pressure is 115 over 73 and heart rate is 105. Echo shows EF of 25% with a global hypokinesis and inferior akinesis. Troponin I peaks at 0.5 nanogram per milliliter with a rise and fall pattern. ECG shows diffuse AC depression and inferior Q waves. Creatinine is 1.7. What is the management beside diuresis? A. Urgent coronary angiography. B. Coronary angiography later during this hospitalization. C. Coronary angiography later during this hospitalization and give antithrombotic anti therapy. D. Perform stress testing later during this hospitalization. E. Perform elective coronary angiography in the outpatient setting. The answer is B. Perform coronary angiography during this hospitalization, but not urgently, and give antithrombotics. In this patient, Q waves are suggestive of an ischemic etiology of heart failure. Q wave infarct may be recent, coinciding with his onset of symptoms. Moreover, global ischemia is suggested by the extensive AC depression and the wall motion abnormality that extends beyond the infarcted territory. Thus, heart failure is secondary to a recent infarction and acute ischemia. He should be treated as type 1 MI with antithrombotic therapy, and he should undergo coronary angiography once he has received proper diuresis. In acute heart failure, in the absence of acute ST elevation or cardiogenic shock, and geography or PCI are not warranted urgently, as the following three periprocedural factor may actually precipitate a downhill course of shock and massive pulmonary edema requiring urgent intubation in patients who are initially stable and justifying the delaying of coronary angiography and PCI. The three factors are supine positioning, which increases preload, LVDP, and myocardial ischemia, Number two, contrast loading, which does the same, also increases preload and LVDP and ischemia. And number three, sedation, which blunts the compensatory vasoconstriction and tachycardia of pre-shock and leads to full-blown shock. Therefore, in somewhat stable patients with acute heart failure and suspected uh, myocardial ischemia, Coronary angiography is usually performed one to three days later once proper diuresis has been achieved. Only unstable heart failure patients, such as those with shock or massive pulmonary edema already requiring mechanical ventilation, who also have ongoing deep ST depression. So it's that combination of shock or massive pulmonary edema plus ongoing deep ST depression those are the patients who are treated with an immediate invasive strategy within two hours. Other than that, coronary angiography is performed a day or few days later once the patient has been properly diuresed and stabilized. This attitude is, um, has also been um, suggested in a recent May 2021 Jack review paper. This has also been suggested by CAMIR NIH uh, registry, Korean registry, which showed that in-hospital mortality was higher in patients who got PCI within two hours, and 12-month mortality was higher in patients who got PCI within 24 hours. Again, I'm talking about patients with non-STEMI who also have acute heart failure. Next question, a 49-year-old man presents with progressive dyspnea over the last week. He recalls having two hours of mild chest discomfort and nausea 10 days ago. No chest pain is currently reported. His ECG shows anterior Q waves with one millimeter ST elevation and T inversion. The exam and X-ray suggest pulmonary edema. The echo shows enteroapical akinesis and thinning. Beside diuresis and medical therapy, what is the appropriate management? A, 
coronary angiography emergently B coronary angiography is not urgent but should be performed before discharge attempt to open an occluded LAD C perform stress spec before discharge then perform coronary angiography only if there is evidence of severe ischemia D test for viability of the anterior wall if viable perform coronary angiography and attempt to open an occluded LAD. The answer is C, perform stress test before discharge and only perform coronary angiography selectively if significant ischemia is found. Unlike the prior question, this patient's heart failure, heart failure is fully related to the anterior Q-wave MI and he is presenting late more than 24 hours after MI, as suggested by his symptoms 10 days ago, and by the EKG, which predominantly shows Q waves with only mild, subtle residual ST elevation and T inversion. In the preceding question, heart failure was due to global ischemia more than just the Q wave MI. This question is an illustration of, a, of the OAT trial which is a very important trial that often gets asked on board tests. In the old trial, patients with large MI older than 24 hours, uh, mainly STEMI or Q-wave MI, who are selected based on the following features did not benefit from PCI, late PCI, and had a trend towards more frequent recurrent infarctions. Those are the features that were used in the old trial and that eventually have shown that patients with those features do not benefit from late PCI. So one totally occluded infarct-related artery, not subtotally occluded, totally occluded with TIMI 0 or 1. Two, akinetic or dyskinetic infarcted wall, not hypokinetic. Uh, one or two vessel CAD, no recurrent rest or low threshold angina, no severe ischemia on stress testing, and no shock and no severe persistent functional class 3, 4 heart failure. If you have a non-totally occluded artery or a hypokinetic wall, or if you have a residual or rest or low threshold angina or ischemia, then the patient is not an OAT trial patient and he may benefit from late PCI. The OAT trial led to the following conclusion regarding patients presenting late uh, over 24 hours after a large MI. Again, large MI, STEMI or Q-wave MI, this is not non-STEMI. So if PCI was not performed in the first 24 hours, whether the patient received fibrinolytic therapy with or without success or did not receive fibrinolytic therapy, in the absence of angina recurrence or shock or severe persistent heart failure, stress testing is preferred to coronary angiography. Again, this is late STEMI or QAVE MI presentation. More than 24 hours, stress testing is preferred to coronary angiography based on the old trial as well as based on the current uh, ACC, AHA, and ESC STEMI guidelines. Coronary angiography is a less favored alternative, but it may be performed, and practically, we often perform coronary angiography probably more often than stress testing. So it's an acceptable alternative, although by guidelines, it is a less favored alternative. It has the following recommendations in the ACCHA uh, guidelines. Coronary angiography over 24 hours after STEMI onset is a class 2B. PCI of a stenotic but not totally occluded artery is given a class 2B, and I will further detail that in the next slide. So it's acceptable to open an artery that's not totally occluded over more than 24 hours after a large MI, STEMI or QAVE MI. Avoid PCI of a totally occluded artery over 24 hours. If you perform coronary angiography over 24 hours and find the totally occluded artery, avoid PCI of that artery based on the OAT trial, and this is given a class three. The exception being cases of recurrent angina uh, after late after MI, high risk stress test, and this is given class one, 
or persistent severe heart failure with severe functional limitation despite diuresis, or when you are not certain of the timing. Made that, note that the European Society uh, guidelines use a 48-hour rather than a 24-hour cutoff. I want to provide two notes regarding those late MI presenters. Again, I'm talking about STEMI or Q-Wave MI late presenter, not non-STEMI. It's very common and fairly routine to revascularize non-STEMI beyond 24 hours. So this only applies to STEMI or Q-Wave MI. So in STEMI or Q-Wave MI, data suggests that an infarct artery that is not totally occluded may benefit from late revascularization to the same extent that it may benefit from early revascularization as a patent infarct artery with good collaterals is associated with a more limited MI size and a significant amount of viable myocardium that can be salvaged with revascularization. And relevant to this idea is the fact that 35% of totally occluded infarct-related arteries spontaneously recanalize in the first 24 hours and may qualify for late revascularization should the patient undergo late coronary angiography. This is based on three uh, important studies, including one uh, randomized trial, BRAVE2. A second important note in those late MI presenter is the di distinction between ischemia and viability, which are two different entities, ischemia being the one most definitely improved with revascularization late post-MI, as shown in the SWISI2 trial. Along those lines, all trial excluded patients with uh, significant ischemia. What's the difference between viability and ischemia? Viability implies that at rest, the infarcted territory can uptake significant nuclear uh, agent, over 50% nuclear uptake, with no change between rest and stress. Conversely, ischemia implies that with stress, the nuclear defect in the infarcted or peri-infarcted territory is significantly more intense or more extensive than at rest, or significant ST segment deviations or chest pain occur with stress. The lack of ischemia, as in this case here, means that the myocardial territory is already receiving enough blood supply and should be able to recover its function had it been truly viable, which questions the value of revascularization. Whereas ischemia suggests that the myocardial territory is not receiving enough blood supply and may recover its function with revascularization. That's why ischemia is more likely to benefit from revascularization than mere viability in late MI presenters. In a sub-study of all patients who received viability testing, viability did not predict the benefit from late PCI. Next question, a 68-year-old woman presents with dyspnea and syncope. Her EKG shows anterior ST elevation and Q waves. Her systolic blood pressure is 90 and she appears obtunded and in distress. Though butamine is started by the emergency department, but her systolic blood pressure drops to 78 with dobutamine. Emergent coronary angiography is done and shows patent coronary arteries with minimal luminal irregularities. Left heart catheterization is performed. It shows LV pressure of 160 over 35 with LVDP of 35 millimeter of mercury and an aortic pressure of 78 over 58 millimeter of mercury. What is the next step? A, diuresis, B, switch from dobutamine to phenylephrine, C, switch from dobutamine to norepinephrine, D, balloon pump, E, impella, or F, aortic valve, valvuloplasty. The answer is B, switch from dobutamine to phenylephrine. This patient has cardiogenic shock with what initially seemed to be anterior STEMI. The combination of a definite anterior STEMI on ECG, yet patent coronary arteries on angiography, is highly suggestive of Takusubo syndrome, particularly in a postmenopausal woman. Q waves are uncommon in Takusubo, but may be seen in around 30% of, of Takusubo patients. 
There are two forms of cardiogenic shock in Takotsubo syndrome. One, classic shock from myocardial depression, and two, shock that results from LVOT obstruction, which results from that hypercontractile LV base. The hypercontractile base narrows the LVOT and creates a drag of the anterior mitral leaflet and SAM, which further narrows the LVOT with a pathophysiology similar to hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. This patient has the second form of shock, the LVOT obstruction shock, as evident by the fact that a positive inotropic agent, in this case dobutamine, has worsened her shock via worsening of that LVOT obstruction. Also, in the context of this case, the gradient that we see between LV and aortic pressure LV pressure was 160 millimeter of mercury. Aortic systolic pressure was 78 millimeter of mercury. This systolic gradient is a gradient across the LVOT, not the aortic valve in the context of this case. And this indirectly further confirms the diagnosis of Takosubo. Balloon pump reduces afterload and worsens LVOT obstruction and should be avoided in this case. Alpha agonists increase afterload and reduce LVOT obstruction and the shock. Impella reduces the preload and worsen LVOT obstruction. Therefore, the treatment here is alpha agonists. Next question, a 57-year-old man presented with anterior STEMI and received the primary PCI of the proximal LED at 16 hours after pain onset. At day three, the patient is doing well, ambulating without angina and no heart failure. He had an asymptomatic 14-beat run of non-sustained VTAC. At day four, a pre-discharge echo is performed and shows a large area of interior akinesis with an EF of 25%, mild mitral regurgitation, and moderate size, one centimeter pericardial effusion. What is the next step? A, discharge home on ACE, beta blockers, pyronolactone, statin, aspirin, plavix, and check echo in 40 days. If EF less than 35%, place an ICD. B is similar to A, except no spironolactone. C, monitor the patient in the hospital for a longer period of time, repeat echo next day, and obtain cardiac MRI. D, discharge home on ACE, beta blocker, statin, aspirin, plavix, place a live vest, and then ICD at 40 days, if EF less than 35%. The answer is C. Monitor the patient for a longer period of time in the hospital and perform cardiac MRI. This is because of the pericardial effusion. That is the red flag in that whole question. A moderate pericardial effusion is concerning for a sealed cardiac rupture and warrants further observation and MRI if possible. This is based on this paper published in circulation in 2010. It has shown that when you have a moderate pericardial effusion, there is a cardiac rupture in at least 80% of the cases that will progress to a full-blown rupture and full-blown tamponade. Therefore, caution is warranted. Late non-sustained VT over 48 hours, as happened in this patient, while carrying a worse prognosis does not per se change management and does not dictate an earlier ICD before 35 days and does not dictate live vest placement. Next question, a 78-year-old woman presents with anterior STEMI. She undergoes primary PCI of 100% occluded proximal LED. She continues to have persistent ST elevation post-PCI along with Q waves. Echo shows extensive anterolateral akinesis with EF of 25%. Telemetry shows frequent polymorphic PVCs with occasional couplets and triplets even over 48 hours after her presentation. Beside beta blockers and aldosterone antagonists, which of the following has been shown to reduce the early risk of arrhythmic, arrhythmic death post-MI? A, live vest, B, amiodarone, C, both live vest and amiodarone. The answer is B. This patient has an increased risk of arrhythmic death, including in the first 40 days, because she has a large infarct size, persistent ST elevation suggestive of an irreversible myocardial injury, and frequent PVCs.
in both EMIAT and CAMIAT trials, amiodarone initiation in the early post-MI period, less than 40 days, significantly reduced the risk of arrhythmic death by 35% with a significant p-value. Overall death was not reduced, however. Amiodarone is not routinely used after MI, but may be used selectively in patients with the highest sudden death risk in this early period, such as this patient, while awaiting the eventual ICD implantation 40 days later. You may use it temporarily for one or two months. Regarding live vest, in the large vest trial, the use of live vest early after MI reduced arrhythmic death by 35% as well, but the reduction was not statistically significant, unlike the amiodarone trials. Live vest reduced overall death by 35% as well, and this was borderline significant. Therefore, live vest is not to be used uh, systematically after a large MI. It may be used very selectively in a small group of patients perceived to be at a very high risk of sudden death in those first 40 days after MI, but this should be a minority of patients. And for all we know, uh, amiodarone may achieve the same uh, target of reducing arrhythmic death in those first uh, 40 days after MI. 